Today, we're going to talk about using chat GPT in these really practical applications for nonprofits. So Eric is an IT infrastructure manager leading a team navigating the intricate IT systems and implementing scalable solutions. He's really embraced artificial intelligence with his team, and they're using tools like ChatGPT4 in their team's workflow, which has significantly boosted their communication, decision-making, and productivity. But he's just not just a technical guy. Outside of that life, Eric's also the proud father of a curly-haired boy, a thing I used to be many years ago, and who shares his passion for technology and loves assisting him on computer projects. Ladies and gentlemen, in the chat, please give me your clapping emojis for Eric. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. We're going to be talking about chat GPT, and I will be also going into other large language models, such as Palm 2 by Google, something you can use for free at bard.google.com. Very powerful tool. But primarily, we're going to be talking about use cases of chat GPT. Um, I use ChatGPT4 quite extensively at work for professional development and just to help solve any problems where I have the gap in skill or knowledge. So let's move up here. We're going to start by talking about why does this matter? Always very important to keep people's interests. We'll go over how it's impacted my workplace and how it's continuing to impact it, ways in which you can. So, We'll be going into three different areas of practical applications for the chat GPT platform. And then we'll be getting into generative AI artwork and where you might find that useful as well. And lastly, but not least is the prompt engineering and the journey demo. So those are going to be like the really fun part where we can get crazy. So. Why does this matter? Nonprofits are always, I've been working with nonprofits all the way back to my teenage years. 27 years ago, I was working with Reach Community Development Center, and I always saw how much they had to write, just the sheer volume of emails and newsletters and grant proposals and follow-ups. It's an incredible amount of communication. And where large language models really make a difference is in making that faster, more efficient, and taking the mental firewood chopping aspect of this kind of work out of the equation so you can focus more on how to do it like creatively and interestingly and do it better. Mm -hmm. You're going to be doing automations in anything you can think of. You, you could automate writing your newsletter. You could, let's move down to scaling communications. So. <clears throat> I find this one really useful myself since I have to send out a lot of IT communications. Nonprofits are always trying to reach a fairly broad audience, but people want to be addressed specifically. So it can be very useful to individualize communications to different sectors or groups or even individual people at scale if you have the right tools at hand. I find it very useful for doing data analysis. I've been able to use ChatGPT4 with plugin modules to input Excel spreadsheets to give insights into data. And it's also nice for fostering better engagement relationships because in your volunteer emails, you could create a spreadsheet with every volunteer with a few notes about them that you've noted from your individual interactions and maybe their birthday or something, and then you could uh, have letters generated for the entire spreadsheet to individualize to each person. Pretty cool tool. Moving forward here. I did a presentation for our HR department about eight weeks ago, and I was able to go back to them and get feedback to see how this made a big difference to them. Sorry, Eric, I just want to pop in one more time and just say, yeah, if you can come in, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the reminder. The big one is in recruiting. They have to do a lot of resume analysis. So one of the, during my prompt engineering demo for them, I showed how to take a resume and a job description and say, where is this person strong? Where are they weak? Generate a summary. And I showed them how to do this for multiple resumes at a time against one description. And it, it drastically increased how quickly she was able to go through resumes and figure out 
who she should give more individual attention to. So it's not really taking individual attention out of the equation so much as helping refine it. Another way they found it useful is that we, as our HR department generates a large volume of newsletters and LinkedIn content, and just they have to answer a lot of questions and chat GPT is very powerful for implementing, for doing standardized responses. You can use tools created by companies leveraging this technology to help you do that, or you can develop solutions yourself. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty wide open at this point. Let's move on here. Now, a bit one I wanted to start with is communications and marketing, which I've already been talking about. Donors, money, that's a really big deal for nonprofits. So you have a mission, you have to pay salaries, you know. It, it really matters. And that's where this is one of the areas where it can make a really big impact. Like I was saying, you can tailor messages for the donors based on their interests, the interactions in your CRM that you've had with them, because hopefully you're capturing that data, because if you're not, you're going to be missing out on leveraging these tools. So it's definitely an area to work on if your organization isn't collecting individualized data, because I think that's going to be the future of these communications. It's very nice for interacting with volunteers. It's pretty simple to implement the kind of functionality where you could have donors go to a web page, work with a chat bot and let the chat bot know what their schedule was and what kind of opportunities were present and where their schedule and those opportunities intersect. And so instead of having a person do that, it can all just be automated which would be a big time saver for volunteer coordinators. And then, like I was saying earlier, being able to reach out to individuals to thank them for their contributions versus just a generic, hey, dear John, thank you for your generic help. You could cite their individual contributions because you'll be a lot of time to keep track of them. It'd be worthwhile to do that, I bet. And then it's also incredibly useful for analyzing feedback from people because if you're working with hundreds of volunteers and you're getting surveys back from them, wouldn't it be nice if you could just dump those into chat GPT and kind of generate like a summary of the different feedback and the frequency of it and anything else you wanted to know about it. Just use your imagination and that's going to do a lot of extra work for you. Program delivery, being able to look at your programs and describe what you're doing and ask for ideas. So you could say, Hey, I've got this nonprofit that is educating my neighborhood about interactions between black bears and people and how to manage those safely and reduce unsafe interactions. You could ask for help on how do I find more volunteers for this sort of work? What are some channels I could reach out to people on? What if you're, what if you're brand new to nonprofits, don't know anything, you could just say that I don't know anything, help me come up with a plan from step one and it'll crank it out for you. Usually good enough to get started. It's also great for automating anything that's repetitive in your position. Copilot for Microsoft that's built into office 365 is in beta right now. It's, it's about 600 businesses participating. They're going to be opening it up probably in Q3 for uh, testing. And it's basically chat GPT four integrated into Microsoft office. So it'll be in your PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, and Google's already doing that in their Microsoft or their Google workspaces platform. So they're in the process of integrating the Palm two large language model into each application. And it's still at a fairly basic level, but you can even opt it in Gmail. It'll help you write emails. It's very powerful for doing analytical work. So it's going to make your job, it's going to make you more efficient at what you're doing. Fundraising. Okay. Let's we'll start at the bottom one, grant writing assistance. How much time did this take? I imagine that you put a ton of time into writing grants. This is going to make that so much faster. You can use examples of your existing work. You can start a new chat up in chat GPT four and say, here are a few examples of some grants I've written. Please write a grant for, for this company with these parameters in this same style. 
and suddenly Chappie GBT is cranking out grants and your voice, you're obviously going to want to proofread them because large language models can hallucinate and lie and it really helps to have an expert look over their work. Kind of think of it like a genius intern, like an intern that knows way more than you, but has no common sense. So you got to bring the common sense to the process. Yeah. Being able to dig into donor data and find new patterns that you could leverage to help generate interest and revenue and what other people you could reach out to that can help you generate ideas for that. And for planning and promotion events, describe the event you want, describe the theme, where it's going to be, who your target people are. And suddenly it's cranking out an event plan for you. And you can just, obviously you're still going to have to go over it and give it some love, give it your editorial touch, just like I did for this presentation. I use ChatGPT to write it, of course, but it does take, like I said, an editorial touch. Oftentimes I'll crank out. 15 or 20 slides and choose my favorite three or four or five or combine them or just depends on what, what you're doing. Let's move on here. And when we're doing prompt engineering, ask me questions about this. I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest. So tell me your use case and what you want to do. Saving time and money. So for anyone who didn't see it, John Oliver married a cabbage on his show. They did an AI generated video for it. And I decided to do a little bit of my own art to commemorate that. So we're talking about generative AI. What is that? It's, it's like a, like the example I'm using today is mid journey, which is a generative AI art tool. You just put in a description and it cranks out the picture for you. You can use your imagination as to what I said to get this guy to show up. I also used a face swapper. So mid journey will produce uncanny valley faces of celebrities. So if you have a good high res photo, you can generate your picture of them or of yourself or of your brother or of your mom and put their face on any picture you want. I've been doing that for my family lately and it's pretty fun. There's actually a number of questions that have come in. Do you want to tackle a couple of those first and then we can get into the demos? So here's the first one, sure. I'll start off really technical here. Are there plugins in JavaScript or PHP that can bring that chat GPT functionality into an app you're building? Into an app. If you're talking about chat GPT for specifically, there's several ways you can get, a, 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 interact with it through an API. So you can just get a paid account and then you have a, a API access where you pay per token, which is. Basically, it's not quite a word. It could be a section of a word. So some words will be one token, some will be two or three tokens. Or you can go through Microsoft Azure. They have a chat GPT-4 AI that meets regulatory requirements. So whether you're working with PHI or whatever else, you can rest assured that it's being done according to the most stringent standards. Like so there is some API point. access, but you're going to have to create a paid account one way or another for that, because it's got some costs associated with it. That is um, right. There is no free lunch. You can, there are open source large language models that you can run on your own hardware. And that's just you and Google and the hugging face has everything you need. Cool. The next set of questions are really around, around the privacy part of this, which is to say, when you start putting things into the system, who owns into ChatGPT? Who owns that data? What really, like what happens with that? How do we protect the data of the communities we might be working with? Or do we feel like maybe the data structure feels if you have something you have a high level of privacy around, it's inappropriate for at least something like ChatGPT because of the, their data model? Yeah, you don't want to be pasting PHI into ChatGPT's window. Like that's a duh situation. In that case, you'd be wanting to be working with like a certified cloud provider like Azure or AWS or Google Cloud. That's who you want to work with if you're having to meet those kind of standards. Interesting. So there are I other options that can do let you play with these these large language models, but maybe ChatGPT isn't the one because of the way they've structured the data where it's more. Yes. You can actually uncheck your chat so it's not used as training data. And ah. then it deleted after 30 days. So there, that's a thing. So there is a private way to use it that doesn't get used for training. And then it just flushes 
Because that was one of the questions people said, I've got this whole bunch of donor fundraising data. I'd love to have the machine do some pattern recognition to help me find some data in there. But it sounds like if you're going to do that, you're going to want to come at that with a lot of caution. Yeah. You just have to use your common sense and don't put people's social security numbers in there. Don't put private donor information in there. Canada has different laws. In the U.S., you can basically sell anything to anyone as long as it isn't shy. So <laughs> that's just, it's more of an ethical question than a legal question. But in Canada, I'm not an expert in Canadian legal matters. So that's really helpful. I think that gets us to the first round of questions through there. So at this point, yeah, let's move into the first pump engineering mo demo. That'd be great. Okay. So let me stop sharing this window and we'll grab the chat GPT Chrome tab. So this is what a fresh prompt looks like. You'll hit new chat in the upper left. If you are on the free account, ChatGPT 3.5 is the only model you'll have access to. Still very powerful, but it's just not as robust as ChatGPT 4. So we're going to be doing our prompt engineering. I only have 25 messages every three hours. So at most I can do 25 prompts. So I'll probably be doing something like seven to 10 prompts with actually probably four to five prompts with just a few iterations. So you can get the gist of how to work with it. And one thing you'll notice here is that when you hover over GPT-4, you'll see you can enable browsing. So you can tell it, I want to look up some information, go out to the web and grab the latest piece. Honestly, it's not doing a great job right now. This is where Google's Bard is much better because they're just a native search company and they've integrated their AI into it and it works really well. But it's still doable on ChatGPT4. Otherwise, when you're on the default model, its data only extends to 2021. So anything after that, it just doesn't even know it existed. But it's trained on enough stuff that it can make up most of what you need. And then there's also plugins here. When you click on that, you can click this guy and go to the plugin store and this is where you can find stuff to upload Excel files for data analysis and to do all sorts of specialty stuff. Obviously there's like search flights and rental cars and whatever that kind of, who cares? There's other more interesting things. So we're going to close out of that and just use the default chat GPT-4. And let's look at the chat. Elijah, what's a prompt that someone wants me to work on? Do we even get anyone? So we don't have any prompts in the chat yet, but if you want to maybe start with one test one, that'll help inspire people to add their own sample okay. prompts there into the chat. So what I'll start with is I'm, I'm interested in starting a nonprofit about, let's say, saving salmon in the Columbia River in Oregon. I could take to get this off the ground. And we can give some parameters on what kind of response we want, but sometimes it's nice just to talk to it like a normal person because it is a language model and it'll surprise you what you can get out of it. First, we need to find what are the problems the salmon are facing and then figure out what our nonprofit is doing about that, what our goal is, and then obviously a group of people to implement that goal. They need a plan. We have to register the nonprofit and you can see, you can read. So, <laughs> but fundraising website, partnerships, program development. So really this can fill very big gaps in knowledge. Uh, yeah. Can you shorten this email? <laughs> yeah. One example could be, okay, that plan is great. Great. So you don't have to be this polite if these things ever gain sentience and you were really rude to them. I don't know, guys. Be polite. So <laughs> that's an AI safety joke, but seriously. So thanks. I need something more concise and let's focus on what I can do in the next time. Um, Give me a 30 day plan where I do at least one thing per day to get this started. 
So this would be really nice if you really are just getting something off the ground. Maybe some of you are in chat. If you're working with nonprofits, you probably have other projects that you care about that you might have side projects going for. And you could leverage this tool to do that with very little time versus having to do it all from scratch, having to consult with experts. Now, let's see, it's being slow right now and that's okay. Let's pop over and give our friend Bard a visit. Is it, Elijah, is it showing Bard on my tab or is it just showing? No, we're still just seeing chat GPT. Okay. I'm not excited that it's taking so long, but. You've asked it to do something really hard. I did. Come on guys, we can start a new chat. Let's see, does anyone have any ideas now? Yeah, why don't I start one off here? Or, okay, go ahead, Elijah. Yeah, so here's one that I get all the time, which is sometimes you're in a communications meeting and you're brainstorming the, what is gonna be the awesome title for this new report on protecting salmon in the Columbia River. Can I get it to say, give me multiple variants on it? Give me five different Wait. versions? So, I am putting together a report on saving the salmon in the Columbia River in Portland, Oregon. Please give me 20 different eye-catching and fun titles for this report. And you can put in whatever number. You could put in 50. There is a token, like a limit to what it can do. But when it hits that limit, you can actually click continue generating and it'll keep going, but it will use up another one of your 25 responses every three hours. So this is a really powerful brainstorming tool. I can see that it's just, yeah, give me yeah, lots of cool. options to play with. And if I want to add more details, can I then go into the message and say, actually the report's about this specific thing. It's about like gravel for salmon beds and things like that. Yeah, the report is specifically about, about gravel bed restoration in ancestral streams to encourage population growth. Give me 20 titles based on that. And heck yeah, you can do that. So let's read a few of them. These ones were bad though. Making waves, the battle to save salmon in Portland's Columbia River. Turning the tide. A lot of good puns. I work with a communication specialist. All they're going to do is give you puns, especially fish people. So I can't tell you why it's pausing like this. Ah, something went wrong. There you go. <laughs> so it looks like regenerate response. Only well, we must come on. But so what I'm seeing here though well, is we're being rewarded for being really wordy and descriptive. Put everything in there with yeah. pleases and thank yous. Like, Exactly. You don't even, a lot of times I'll just give a commands, just not, nothing like all this technology is nothing on the level of being conscious or having emergent properties of conscience, consciousness yet. And they're thinking that once these things have physical embodiment and they link up enough different AI modules, we're going to get there pretty quick, but you don't, have to worry, you don't have to worry about that yet. So yeah, revitalizing riverbeds, gravel restoration and ancestral streams for salmon survival. So yeah, whatever your, whatever your ideas you're needing. Cool. I've got another interesting one coming here from Tracy who says, what is the top 10 list of federal government grants for protecting salmon? Okay. Let's actually start a new chat with web connection. And so could you repeat that again, Elijah? Yeah. Give me a list of the top 10 grants from the government for salmon organizations. Grants from the Canadian There yeah, we go. Nice work. For grant, because I know that's who the, who the chapter is serving here. Grant applications. Please use the latest data from the internet. Okay. Ooh. Now this is a little slow. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to show us what steps are and what's doing the search and being for us. It's clicking on links and scraping the information and reading it. And then it's putting all that into the large language model to generate our output. Right. So yeah. We just noticed that we forgot the word salmon in that prompt. So it might be a little too broad in this particular case, but while it's going through, here's another question from Airman who says, are all of these responses unique for each user or 
if we all put the same prompts in, are we going to get basically th the same answer for each one of us using the tool? They'll be different every time. This thing has, there's billions and billions of parameters to these models. And so everything that it creates is emergent and they're constantly updating and tweaking the model and putting in safety guidelines that people can't do evil, gross stuff with it. And so it's continually changing how it works. You'll never get the same thing twice. And that's where it's useful. Once it generates output, see these right here, I can say there are only two sources of grants from the Canadian government for nonprofits on this list. Please come up with eight more. So you can tell it that it was wrong and it'll go, oh, it'll actually apologize to you. Sorry about that. And then give you what you actually want. Because it's not, it, like I said, it's not thinking. It doesn't have common sense. So that's where we have to bridge the gap. Let's see. And then we can, once this is done, I want to swap over to Bard for a bit because I think I want to do the same task and show you how much better Bard does it. <laughs> Uh, how much more quickly. I know some people are saying they can't reach it, but that's where VPNs come into play. NordVPN, who advertised on every YouTube channel ever, every podcast, is a very safe one to go through. So you can have the freedom to use the tools that you want to use. But make sure to check in with your leadership that they're not going to be upset that you're putting whatever information into it. So definitely you want to have a conversation and be responsible about using the tool. Let's see. So it went through and actually found more sources for funding, the funding range, and talked about some other programs to explore. That was a lot more useful. Right. Sorry, Eric, is there a limit on, on things that maybe get too niche? So say you're looking for grants for salmon organizations in Vancouver, and then maybe you say for youth organizations, is there a point where it's just going to say, sorry, that thing doesn't exist. Try again. Well, it's, sometimes it'll just make up stuff for you. It'll lie. It'll be like, yeah, this totally exists, bro. And if you'll go and look and you'll be like, no, it doesn't. Is that I more like common in, like, in a really niche ask or area that it may hallucinate more often? No, not necessarily. It's just going to... It's just going to happen when it happens. And what I like to do is for Bard specifically, I like to ask it to list its sources of information it's using. So list the web. So let's give an example of that. I'm looking for grants for my Save the Salmon nonprofit in Vancouver, BC. Please give me a list of a comprehensive with oh, grant sources. And this doesn't cost anything, so that's nice. And so just to remind us again, so BARD is basically Google's equivalent of what we were just looking at? Yeah. So here, it's saying government grants. It's listing some foundations. And see how much, do you see how much quicker that was than ChatGPT4 and how much, how many more, I don't know. I just think it does a bit better of a job right now. They're in pretty fierce competition, so who's better just depends on the month. Let's see here. Yeah. So some of these might be familiar to you guys in the nonprofit community. That actually, that actually was a really big list. What would you want to do from there? It's a great question. Want... Yeah, that's a great question. Anyone want to give us a recommendation on like how we might want to dig more deeply into this? Yeah. I'm not a nonprofit expert, but I could make something up if people want. Let's see. Based on this list. What are the most accessible sources of funding among these organizations? BART is really great for getting statistical data off of the web. Like I said, you got to tell it to show its sources so that you can verify it. But I've done that multiple times. And as long as you tell it to give you a source, it mostly feel like it hallucinates less because it has to go get it right. instead of just getting it. So, Here's another yeah. really interesting prompt follow-up from Krista saying, can we ask it for to, to prioritize by the nearest deadline, the application deadline? Okay. So prioritize and applications for these sources based on current grant deadlines. 
Like I said, it won't do a perfect job, but let's see. The deadline for applications is July 15th, 2023, September 1st. Here's some foundation grants with dates. So you would need to go double check this information and make sure it was real, but that's a lot easier than having to visit all the individual websites and find where they're announcing this. And, or it's a lot easier to collect information this way. It's search plus data manipulation and analysis all in one. Awesome. That's really helpful to get a sense of that. And yeah, I think we're getting some comments here from some of these things are empty say that's not true or that's not actually available in Canada. So there is always going to be some truthing, but this is a good place to start with some brainstorming. Yeah. You just, Hey, I see that you lied to me, quit lying to me and get real stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes it will. So that's really nice. There we go. Yeah. I think that's yeah, the the, 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 yeah. Do you think there's an interest in moving on to the art demo? Let's do it. Let's art for the moment. Yeah. Okay. So let's stop sharing here and I'm going to share my discord screen. We'll be on my discord server. AI with Eric and I only really just invite friends here. It's just for fun, but I'm using it more and more for business type applications. Currently mid journey requires you to interact with it through discord, which is a very common communication platform used in online digital communities. The more of a geek you are, the more you're likely to know about it. If you don't know about it and you have to use it for this, although they are developing a non discord interface. So that might be in the fall or something, either a phone application or web-based, but for now you got to do it in this little chat out. I have a discord bot that I invited to my server. You can see the mid journey bot here on the right hand side. And you can see the insight face swap bot so we can throw different faces on pictures. I'm probably just going to stick with the mid journey bot for this, uh, for this call. So what, give me an example of some R you need to generate typically for a nonprofit. Someone just spit it out in chat, pretend we're on whose line is it anyways? So I'll start off. Let's live in salmon land. So I'm going to look for a family of three fishing for salmon together next to a beautiful river. So you hit the slash and then you just type, you can type imagine and then you just got to click here. And this is where you have the prompt entry. So a fan, what is it? A family of three. Yeah. By the side of a river fishing for salmon. Family of three at a river fishing for salmon. And we can give it like an artistic style. So let's say cyberpunk. <laughs> I, I like to do stuff like that just to see what's going to happen. Like maybe they're going to fish for like cybernetic fish or they're going to be robot children. I don't know. Maybe that's not so much like a business use case. If you put like a wholesome, like cozy punk style, then you might get something really cute you could use in your newsletter. And you can see it's, it generates it. You look at it and you're like, that's not going to be that impressive. But when it finishes, you're like, damn. So we can see it going stage by stage, adding yeah, a bit more detail. So we can zoom in here and say, we can see the different like cyberpunk paraphernalia in the background. Like they're fishing, but they're also they're, like, there's a floating fish here. <laughs> it has a hard time with hands and sometimes things are just weird. Like this here, look at that baby with half a face. We can say, you know what? I was not that impressed. So let's, let's yeah, let's, I'm going to, let's try another prompt here. I've got a couple other suggestions here. People are asking for logos and icons. So what if we tried a logo for a salmon nonprofit? Say the salmon nonprofit in Canada. And the other thing is you can specify the aspect ratio. So if you want to make like a really long skinny bar, the command is dash dash space AR space. And then you can do 16.9, which is the format I use to make all the images for this presentation. Cause now being aspect ratio. Okay. Yeah. So I made all of the art for the presentation in mid journey. So you can actually get very businessy with it. If you know what to do. So let's imagine. Prompt, boom. So this is going to give us a white screen logo, and we could do the same thing. I have to do the imagine first and then paste it in and we'll do four to four to three is the default aspect ratio. So you don't actually have to prompt for that. That's what it cranks out by default. 
But for example, I used the journey to create my LinkedIn profile header because I just thought it looked cool. But I've seen a ton of people using it for logos. Let's see what else. An illustration for an app. Okay, I'm going to copy this one out because that's a cool prompt. So let's go back here and take a look. So what do you guys think? Pretty neat? That's like, pretty cool. Can you do the same kind of iteration as you did with the other ones? You're like, say I wanted to all be like flat as opposed to an illustrated yeah. design. 100%. These are two different ones we generated. You can either hit the refresh button, which will crank out the same thing, but different. Or if you like one in particular, you're like, you know what? This bottom one, it has a native art element to it. And let's get some variations on that. I like this one too. So let's upscale it and get a full size resolution image. And so here's the full size. You're able to click on the web button and download it. Or there's a, a page in, on the Mid Journey website, which you're able to look at all of your generated art and save it and organize it. So here's the first question anyone's boss asks first, which is who owns the copyright for that fancy new logo? You do. You just crank it out and use it. I don't know. There's the thing is there's still a lot of legal questions around this stuff. So it depends on your country of, of residence. I, my best uneducated guess is that go ahead and use it. It's not based off of any, these are trained on real human artists. So there is in a sense, like this might have an element of some different artist styles, but it is a completely new creation based on your imagination and what the neural net cranks out. So right. it's not actually directly ripping off anyone. I just want to do something funny for the geeks out there. Imagine we're going to do the salmon prompt or actually we're going to do the eight mind chakra, but we're going to do, we're going to make it. Warhammer 40k. <laughs> so you can throw in whatever prompt you're cranking out. You can add in different styles like video games or movies or directors. A great one who made, who just moved out of Android City. Oof, that form line art. Yeah. The thing is, this isn't going to replace professional artists. It's going to make professional artists much more productive. I got, this is going to crank out something a little more Halloween-y than non y but Someone was saying mid journey is more fun for making art for their kid. And I, I totally get that, that that's of course I prompted at Warhammer 40 K and that's just where the subject matter is. If we scroll back up, I was actually doing some iteration. <laughs> this was my John Oliver artwork that I was doing. There was a big thing on Reddit about that. So let's scroll up and my friend and I were just shooting prompts back and forth to iterate. So here we go. Here's a, an image that you could see at a nonprofit, right? something like this, these guys here, this kind of artwork is really popular for nonprofit, the style, hopefully that this is the one I used on my final page of my presentation, which has all of the continued learning resources. I, I like the phrase epic detail and prompts. Yeah. I was going to say, I should show you the very first image I did. It was like a hyper-realistic portrait where you can specify the camera and where you're shooting from and the lighting. And some people are getting very incredible results out of mid journey. There's also ways to generate specific styles and you can learn about that in the resources I've included on the presentation. You can you download a copy of the PowerPoint presentation it's at the end. So let's see what else we have in chat here, here. I'm going to copy that from Charles Anderson. We'll just copy that and show you what that looks like. It'll make something a lot more photorealistic. Instead of having to look through the common clip art, the open source stuff that might not have the best quality or be exactly what you want, you can get very specific about what you want. While that's going, let's see. Are there any other image generators besides Midjourney? Absolutely. They're stable diffusion which is an open source generator, which has different capabilities than mid journey. You can run it on your local system. If you have something that's more powerful, or you can find places online where you can just do the prompts and generate the artwork. And there's also Dolly two by OpenAI, 
which it's not the best one. It'll crank out some AI art, but I really like the results I get in mid-journey a lot better. And you can just use Google. There's lots of free AI tools for cutting out pictures. And I just saw a video of AI tool that had the same functionality as Adobe, where you could take like a photo in mid-journey, put it in, and then outfill it, just like in the Photoshop ads. So that capability is getting out there. But of course, if you can get Adobe Acrobat through TechSoup, or Adobe Photoshop, rather, and Illustrator, you can just use those tools. They're going to be really good. All right, where are we at time-wise? We got seven minutes left. So what did y'all want to do with the last seven minutes? I want to keep this interesting so if we can get a follow-up question, that'd be awesome. If not, I will just go into some personal projects. So some other ways you can use large language models that might not be immediately evident. You can train them on your own data. So there's ways to either use things like with OpenAI's ChatGPT4, through their API, there's a way to basically prompt engineer the responses that get to the end user. So you can tell it what kind of chatbot it is, what it should be doing, what it should not be doing. And you can even point it to data sources. That depends on the chatbot. You're, I'm still getting into that. It's really technical and there's a ton of approaches to training and fine tuning. That'll be, oh, let's see, AI to automate processes. Let's do some automation together. Let's try and think of something. So I would just go to chat GPT and ask it. So. Let's see, I need to create hundreds of Google Workspace accounts per week for our volunteer program. What are some ways I can use automation to fix this? Or I could have said something different, automation to be more efficient. So can be cumbersome and time consuming. See how sympathetic it is. So it's saying, hey, go to the Google Workspace Admin S SDK and you can- They are just a heads up that we're still on the- the Oh, the journey. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. No okay. worries, no worries. There we go. So back to where we were. So you can see here, now you can see, it's telling you Google Workspace Admin SDK, Google App Script, or you can use JavaScript third parties, CSV imports, develop custom app. And you could say, okay, so let's say you just want to go with result one, the Google admin SDK create. I'm a complete beginner at automation. Help me understand how to leverage Google workspace admin SDK to complete, to build this automation. ChatGPT will do coding for you, Microsoft Copilot. So that's, you can actually tell it to be a programmer and to crank out uh, code for you. For my HR presentation, I told it to act as a visual basic programmer and create a series, create a code that would, with the content for the slides that would create my slideshow for me. And of course I put it in and it had a problem. I copied over the error I was getting and then told it to fix it based on the error. And then it gave me code that worked and it cranked out a 12 page presentation where I was just able to apply styles to it and I was done. And then I used the chat slide summary to generate the speaking notes on a subject I was not at all an expert in. And I came across looking like I didn't know what I was talking about. So let's scroll back up here. Okay. This is going to give you a step-by-step -step guide and you can see it's not always going to be correct. This is where hallucination comes in because this documentation is constantly being updated and changed. So you might actually take this question and also copy it over to Bard and compare the plan it gives you. That's something that I do quite often. So this is things. getting pretty deep in, yeah. in the coding weeds, but I think actually Charles is talking about a more practical use case, which I often hear about, which is... How do I use this to maybe create a, basically a, a what is it, a, a spreadsheet formula? So say I wanted to create like a spreadsheet formula to say, oh, I've got two tabs. 
both with email address, but I want to write the name from one of those to the matching email address in the second tab. Okay, so conditional data formatting like in Excel. Yeah, so totally. Create an Excel formula to duplicate the functionality of conditional data formatting where you match two data types and highlight the duplicates. Okay, I made a misspelling there, but it doesn't really matter. That's pretty smart about figuring out what you actually said. Really helpful on those days where you're tired and need to crank out something coherent. Let's see, you can create a helper column that tells you if a duplicate exists. You can't say, okay, so it's saying that it can't quite do what I'm asking, but here's a way to do something like I'm asking. It's saying that it's gonna compare two columns and a third column, it's gonna give the result. And from Charles, we've got a version of this, which is create a formula that normalizes all the data into lowercase in column C. So it's getting quite specific. Okay, so yeah, let's do that. I'm gonna copy and paste that out of chat. Great, and I wanna say create an Excel formula. Yeah, it's great for this kind of work. Because it's trained on the entire internet. It's on Reddit, it's on every forum, it's on GitHub. So it has like such a vast amount of information to pull from to answer these questions. You're never gonna get this from a human expert. Maybe something like this is pretty easy, but. Yeah, no step-by-step, -step. so that's really helpful. I just wanna sort of flag that we're now at time. We've got one last question here from people saying, like, how do I actually get into mid-journey? What's so, so let me create a new window. I'll do a new private window since I'm logged in on the other one. And let's stop sharing, share screen, and let's do incognito data. There we go. So let's go to midjourney.com. I believe you need to create a Discord account if you don't have one. So you'll say sign in. Let's see. Sign in is on the bottom right corner if you're not seeing what I did. And it looks like you can register an account at the bottom here. If you're already a Discord user, you can log in with a QR code or your Discord username and password. You know, the register button's right here and you can just fill it out and off you go. But you will need to use Discord to interact with the chat bot. So that's how you create those images. Awesome. So that's super helpful. So at this point, I'm actually going to need to bring this to a wrap, unfortunately, but, uh, but I want to say thank you so much, Eric, for coming and sharing and taking us through these live demos, which is always, of course, a terrifying fraught thing. 